Uh, what a lad. Well, for this episode, I'm joined by a rugby league legend. Today's guest, he's been a New Zealand warrior, a Penrith Panther, a West Tiger, while also playing 11 games for the Kiwis. He's since moved to the UK, where he's played for Salford, and now running around for the Featherstone Rovers. And on top of all that, he's a qualified commercial pilot and even a rap artist. And if all that's not enough, he also has one of the craziest stories in sport after finding out his manager had stolen $400,000 out of his bank account over his career. There is plenty to get through on this one. He is one of the great lads. It is Elijah Taylor. Welcome, mate. Hey, James. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Mate, awesome to have you on. Um, like I said, one of the craziest stories. Um, I think the more people that can hear this, um, the better it's only going to do good for um, other people in similar positions that you were in uh, at the time. Um, but crazy career, crazy stories. Yeah, unfortunately, it wasn't didn't feel nice at the time, but you know, we reflect back, you learn your lessons along the way, um, such as life. Uh, you've been through up and downs through your career, some you know, pretty big highs and then some pretty low lows, but um, you just build character along the way and um, hopefully there's someone out there that's listening to this podcast and I can you know, give them some viewpoints and give them some tips of, I suppose, what not to do yeah. and some things what to do. A hundred percent. Let's start with the Featherstone Rovers. You're you're over there in the UK, living the dream. Um, how are you finding it? Yeah, it's uh, it's a bit of a step down in intensity, and in terms of we're not playing in the Super League, we're trying to get up to Super League this season. Uh, they've done a big recruitment drive. Uh, the club's really ambitious. Uh, we, we're trying to make it to the top flight. We're playing second division right now. Mm. We've got some good coaches. I'm um, Sean Long and Leon Price. They're St Helens legends. For any rugby league fans out there, uh, good coaches and yeah, it's a bit of a challenge for me um, stepping down to second division. But we are laying a foundation right now for our preseason. We're working really hard. Our season kicks off this Monday night. Um, we play Keefley, so yeah, it's been a long preseason. Uh, but the boys are keen to rip in. True. How's your body? How's your body coping with another preseason? Yeah. That's one of the biggest things. So in NRL, your, your body gets destroyed with, mm. with pre-seasons, especially the wrestle and contact sessions. But over here, it's, it's more focused on attack. Uh, it's not as focused on defense as back in the NRL. And so trainings are a lot easier. Uh, and you're not training in 40 degree, 30 degree heat like you are back in Penrith or back in uh, Sydney. You're always you know, you're training in the snow sometimes. You're training when it's always raining here. You hardly see the sun in preseason, so it's a lot easier on the body uh, compared to the NRL. Yeah, so you got an- another few years left in you? Because what are you now, 32? Yeah, I'm, th- I'm 32. Uh, feeling good. Probably got maybe two, maybe one more year left in me. Yeah. It depends on depends on the body, really. If I have a, if I have a big injury, I think I'll, I'd call it. Yeah. But um, until then, body feels good, and, and mentally I feel good as well. And as you get older in your career, you know, mentally is that's the biggest one you got to try and uh, conquer every every weekend, every game day, yeah. uh, every preseason. Massively, yeah. And how's the family finding it? Because how many kids have you got? Yeah, they love it over here. I've got four girls. Four girls. Um, yeah, my hand, hands are full. Hands are full. <laughs> but um, yeah, they like it here. The education system, I think, it's a lot better than Australia mm. uh, by far. Uh, my d- kids go to a, a pr- public school. They get free uniform, free iPads. Free stationery, uh, free food. It's weird over here. Like, um, if my kids take a day off school, like the school's ringing me, like, "Where's your kids?" Like, they, you know, they're really harsh yeah. on yeah. education, which is a good thing. I think it's a good thing anyway. Like, yeah. Um, so yeah, the kids love it here. Do a bit of travelling uh, when I got a weekend off, um, which is nice. Obviously, Europe's just a, across the uh, the water there, so. No, it's been good. It's been an experience for all of us. Mm, how good is that? And obviously, you're talking about their educational um, systems, but very different to your upbringing, I'd imagine. Obviously, a proud Taranaki man. Um, I do always like to go back and hear the journeys from the start, so pretty keen to hear about what your childhood was like and what your upbringing was like in Patea, wasn't it? Patea, yeah. yeah South yeah. Taranaki, that's where I grew up in Patea. I was born in Haura. Um, so Pate is about 20 k's down the road south mm. of Hawara, small town, dairy farm. I grew up with uh, four brothers. Uh, my dad, Ron Taylor, he raised us on a, on a dairy farm. Correct. So my, my childhood memories were uh, milking cows, uh, 
like sheep, fencing, planting trees, like just all the farm stuff that you would do yeah. as a farm kid. Like after school, you know, there's always some work to do on the farm somewhere. Really enjoyed it because obviously out on the farm you can you get to up to a lot of stuff. You know, go hunting, go fishing, go earling, um, help out the old man when he needs help. Um, it's something you know when you when you're young you take it for granted massively. Um, like my kids growing up here, it's so cold. We're hardly outside. We're always inside. Um, you hardly see the sun. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's so much things in New Zealand as a New Zealand kid I took for granted. Uh, but no, I really enjoyed it. Went to a small school called Finwakura Primary. There were only 30 kids at the school. It went from uh, J1 up to fourth, standard four, I think. Uh, and then I went to Party High School uh, for two years. And then I then we moved up north with my dad to Karaya, a small town in the far north. Um, and we moved all around there, dad looking for work and stuff. Yeah, but obviously rugby. Was that union? Yeah, it was rugby union, yeah, because there's, there's only rugby union in Taranaki, and mm. it's like pretty much, and when you went up north, rugby union was big as well. You did get the old league game on Sunday, but it wasn't consistent, and it wasn't as well set up as the union season. Yeah. What happened to the farm? So we were working on the farm. So dad was a farmhand, so we used to, mm. he used to work on, I wish we owned it. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we owned it. Yeah, it's a big difference. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, we, we he was a farmer, so we just uh, worked self-employed for ah, the okay. different farmers around Finnukura, and then we settled at the Newlands, and we worked there for about four years. It's good memories, good times. Mm. Is it true you were living out of your car for a, for a while through your childhood? Yeah, that's when we moved up north. So true. It, it was a random story, bro. Like I think Dad Bay Corp were after Dad. He wasn't paying his bills or something. Oh yeah. Like it was just random. We woke up one morning. We, he told us to get in the car from Parti. We drove all the way up to Karai, which is like a bro. It's like a seven hour drive from Parts Taranaki all the way up to the far north. Mm. And then we lived in like in a place called Orfata Hita Kinol. Apps the wop wops. No power, no running water. Like. Yeah, really bad. It was family land out there. Um, and so, bro, yeah, that's when financially it got hard. And then, yeah, we ended up in the car for about two months because it was just... Two months? Bro, it was right. bad. Yeah, man. What was that yeah, like? Yeah, it was, it was crazy time. Where'd you sleep? Just in the in the back seat? Well, there's, what, four brothers? But no, so my two other brothers, they moved to Auckland with my mum. Oh, yeah. And it was me and my other brother, Gabriel, um, with my dad. True. Uh, up north in Karai. So, bro... Those are probably the worst memories of, of my, my childhood, bro, like living up north. Mm. Um, you know, I haven't got the best memories up there, but, um, oh, man, this just makes you want to, when you're a young kid, you just want to succeed after you go through those mm. um, stages in your life, bro. You're just thinking, bro, I'm not doing this when I'm growing up. Like, I want to I wanna play for the All Blacks, bro. I want to play. I'm not doing this, man. Yeah, um, yeah it kind of, you get that. I don't know the fire in the belly or mm. that drive um, to to want to succeed when you go through a pretty tough childhood. True. So is that sort of your was that sort of your motivation throughout your um, I guess early stages of your career, wanting to make it pro in in sport? Yeah, no. Like this time I was like thirteen. Mm. This is two thousand and three, two thousand and four, two thousand and five. So we looked up all those years. I went to Karaya College, um, but yeah, definitely through those hard times. Um, yeah, I think 2004, that's when the Bulldogs won the grand final. Oh, yeah. And I, bro, that's when Sonny Bill was killing it, 2004. And then, yeah, I just wanted to play league, just watching the games. And then 2005, Benji Marshall was playing Tigers. Um, yeah, and just those players, they inspire you. And, you know, the circumstances you're in as a kid, they weren't good. Mm. But, you know, those, you know, those... Those rugby league games or watching those all black games when you're young, bro, they, they do inspire mm. like young kids. I was definitely expi- inspired by watching Dan Carter and Nonu and that. Mm. Um, but no, hard, hard times when I look back, I look back, I'm grateful, but at the time, bro, I hated it. Did you get into much trouble or did, were you getting into any sort of gang related stuff or did sports sort of keep you away from all that? Nah, sports, sports kept me all away from that. And my old man was pretty strict on me too. Yeah. Um, 
and like living out on the on the wafts in a farm, bro, you ain't got neighbors. Mm. Like you're in the middle of paddocks and that, so you can't really get up to no good. Yeah. Um, like there was a we were on a coast too, so bro, you go diving, fishing for food. Um, you live off the land. You, mm. you know, you're in the garden. Um, bro, just going through those experiences at a young age, um, yeah, really build your character and build your drive. But no, I didn't get into too much trouble. Like my dad used to like grow weed in there, but like he never got caught. So, you know, play on. <laughs> <laughs> but you were good at um, rugby union too, weren't you? You're were making all the rep teams, etc. Um, how did you how did you make that transition over to league? Yeah, so obviously, yeah, unions. Um, there was all that was played in Taranaki, mm. and there was all that was played up in, up north. Um, so I started. On Sundays, they play rugby league. So I play rugby union on a Saturday morning, and oh, on yeah. a Sunday morning, the boys used to put it, throw together a league team randomly, and then we used to go and play. And then 2005, I moved down by my mum. I left dad. She lived in Auckland, and um, she told me to try out for St Paul's College and sign up because they played first fifteen on Saturday morning, and they played rugby league on the Wednesday afternoon. Mm. And their history of warriors that go through that school to get to the warriors, um, that was a pathway. And so I jumped at that opportunity in uh, 2000, 2016. I went and signed up to go to St. Paul's College, which is in Grayland, in the middle of Auckland City. And yeah, I was playing first 15. They were in A grade too. So they were in the, they played Auckland Boys, they played Mags, they played Calston, they played St. Kent's. So they were in the top grade at the time. And we played rugby league on a Wednesday afternoon after school. Sure. Um, and that's, yeah, so you play both, get the best of both worlds. Um, St. Paul's College, bro, PE was compulsory. Oh, I've yeah. never seen a school like that, but a college where every day you had to do PE. Sure. I'm sure that's illegal, but <laughs> I remember I remember that was the first school I've ever known for. There was PE every day. Yeah. Um, and that's why a lot of sport players have come out of St. Paul's College in Auckland because um, there's a rich history of rugby league players playing for the Kiwis or playing for the Warriors that come through that school. Mm. What position were you at Union? I was started at open side flanker and then oh, I went to yeah. inside centre. Oh, true. Yeah, so I'd still love to play. Like, before I retire, I'd still love to have one season of, of, of rugby union, just like, even if it's amateur or semi-pro, like, right? I'd still love to do it. Get back to the knacky, mate. They'll sign you up as a midfielder for sure. Or a, or a seven, making 70 tackles a game, mate. You'd be right on. Mate, apparently it's heaps <laughs> technical, like, all the intricacies of the game, like speaking to some yeah. players that have done the crossover. But no, I'd love to do it one day. I'd love to do it before I retire. Mate, how good would that be? So then you did get um, picked up by the Warriors, eh? Um, how did that one come about? Yeah, so on a Wednesday afternoon game, we were playing for St. Paul's. I think we played Mags. And uh, yeah, after the game, uh, Tony Haro, the Warriors scout, he was just saying, mm. yeah, um, would you like to come train with the development squad? on uh, I think it was Monday nights, Wednesday nights, Friday nights. And I was like, yeah, man, oh, bro, I'll be there. I'll be there, don't worry. <laughs> and uh, that's how I got into the Warriors system. So I just turned up. It was for free. There was no contract. He just told me to come and come and train. Yeah. So yeah. I was training there for about a year, just turning up because I was keen as. Um, mm. And then I just persevered, persevered, uh, came through the other side. But um, yeah, I went there, I met. Yeah, some, some young warriors, Sunny Fire, that was the first player I met, and Lisa on Amal, I met him. We were all young kids then. Isaac John, I met, met mm. uh, Russell Packle was young, Ben Madalino was young. Um, and now we had a good little crew there. Mm. And by all accounts, you were, your training uh, intensity was sort of at a next level. One of the boys told me that they remember going back to Mount Smart at like 11 p.m. one day to pick up some protein or something, and you were in the gym in the pitch black, just biking 100k on the bike, just fucking some sort of David Goggins mad stuff. So does that sort of sum up your training ethic? Um, oh, bro, I was just that desperate, eh? I was so mm. desperate to um, just get a first grade contract. Um, yeah, look look back at the times, you're just always trying to chase, uh, you know, chase a full-time gig. You know, whenever we trialed against first grade, like during the week, so under 20s would play 
the Warriors first grade team just in an opposed session, bro, it was like the biggest day of my week, like, because you know Ivan's watching, you know John Eklund's watching, the first grade coaches, so you want to impress, but I was just heaps desperate, bro, especially from my childhood and what I went through as a young kid, um, you only get one shot, bro, one, you know, one opportunity, and then... You're a true rapper. <laughs> <I love that. laughs> bro, I used to listen to him and him all the time, like, all the time. Um, but, yeah, I was just really keen, really desperate, bro, to change my family circumstances, to be able to look mm-hmm. after my family. At a young age, I knew that was my opportunity, and I had to take it. And you had a lot of success with that um, New Zealand 20s group at the time, or the Warriors 20s group at the time. Eh? You mentioned a lot of those players who were in your team, but... Um, you had a really successful time. You were captain as well, weren't you? So um, what are your memories of those games and um, that success? Uh, 2008, yeah, first year of under-20s, that was a tough competition. I remember, you know, all the, all, we were all young then, like Sean Johnson was young, um, mm. bro, yeah, Benny Matz was young, Sonny Fire was young, Lee Son. Um, it was, bro, it was probably the hardest training I've ever done. Uh, it was my first proper pre-season. Um, and I remember, like, on our first day, we got our kit, and Warriors were sponsored by Puma. So we'd got all these Puma gears, got all these Puma shoes, and I was just like, this is crazy. I used to scratch the Puma, make sure it didn't rip off, so it's, like, legit. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, it's Because I never got those clothes when I was young. Bro, I never got those clothes. And I used to think, yeah, we got so many gears, then we were um, staying at the Crown Plaza in Kuji. We were staying at Crown Plazas all over Australia. Uh, we get to fly in New Zealand. I'd never flown out of the country before, like growing up. Um, it's just being in the Kudu Lounge all the time. But, bro, I used to love it because we were, we were only 17 young kids. Mm. Um, yeah, good memories there. A lot of success. Um, obviously, so much competition to get into that team because the whole of New Zealand, the Warriors have got the whole of New Zealand to choose from. And, and then the next year, all the first 15 boys started coming, like Conrad Harrell, uh, Solomon Kata, because all the Warriors started signing the best first 15 guys. Yeah. Um, Curtis Rona, I think he came. Uh, who else? Yeah, a lot of a lot of boys came through um, because obviously it was an attractive um, for young teenagers. You know, you sign semi-pro contracts, you get to fly to Australia every second weekend. Um, yeah, so if you're a young kid, you're a teenager, you've got a rugby and league. Mm. Why wouldn't you give it a crack? Mm. And you're on TV every week too, weren't you? So yeah, you know, that, yeah, it comes that's to right. stardom and all that and, um, side of it that kids want to chase earlier rather than later, eh? Yeah, so like, yeah, just we were so fortunate at the Warriors, man. The Warriors, I look back now and the Warriors was, bro, we got so much stuff as young kids. Like they're sponsored by Vodafone, so we all got an iPhone as soon as the new iPhone dropped, and we all got credit, yeah. and yeah. we all got like Air New Zealand Air points as as young kids, like. I look back now, this was 2008, and I was just like, bro, I was so ungrateful back then. Like, mm. we used to get things handed to us whenever we wanted, but you realize when you come to over here and the game's struggling, like, you get none of that. Uh, you don't get <laughs> looked after. But it taught you it taught you quickly how to be a professional, too. Like, you know, getting to the airport on time, training on time, recovery. How do you recover after a game? Eating well. Um, I think, you know, that, that competition really put players in good stead to set them up for an NRL career. Um, and I think they've, I don't think the Warriors have an under-20s anymore. I'm not sure, but nah. that definitely was a pathway. Like, there was an easy pathway. Like, you could see it. You go from school, you go to the Warriors development, you go to Warriors under-20s, reserves, and then first grade debut. Like, the, mm. the pathway was clear. So, they got to sort that back out, for sure. Mm. Sounded like it was too expensive to... Yeah, bro, yeah. Keep That's that team. Think, it sounded like you were living the life. Vodafone, <laughs> Eric Watson, they just must have been like, here you go, boys. Take it, take it. Yeah. But you did get a call up into the first grade team um, not too long later, eh? But then were you injured? You missed, the, missed your opportunity due to a hammy, wasn't it? Bro, the worst, bro, the worst story, eh? Like, I hadn't been injured for like three years, no injuries at all. Um, yeah. And then Ivan gave me a call on the Tuesday, 2009. Um, yeah, during 2009, I used to always wait for my phone Monday morning or Monday night, just in case Ivan might call me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I used to always have my phone to stay so far. Come on, man. Come on, call me, call me, call me. Um, and yeah, Tuesday, yeah, there's one Tuesday night he called me 
I said I was playing debuting, um, I think it was against Gold Coast. Back home, bro, and I was stoked. Started crying, rang dad, he started crying, rang mum, we started crying. And then at captain's run, like I wasn't even, bro, I wasn't even running fast. I did my hemi. I did a grade two hemi just by taking off. And like I'd, I'd given tickets out to my dad, like I got a box ready in that. Oh, bro, it was so, it was, it was pretty embarrassing. So I, I did my hemi and captain's run. And then I couldn't, I couldn't play for the next three weeks. And that's the first time I've been oh. injured in three, three years, bro. Mate, that's heartbreak. Oh, man. And then I went into a first grade preseason, my first grade, first actual preseason with first grade. And then the week before the trial, I did an ACL doing ladders. Oh. Lad, doing yeah. ladders, bro. I did an ACL doing ladders. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, and that was right before our first trial, so I was out for the whole season, um, and that hurt a bit, because uh, yeah, I just missed my debut by doing a hammy and captain's run, and then I do my ACL before my first grade season, so there's a lot of setbacks when you're a young kid, but again, you know, just character building, you, you know, you learn from those, and just become more grateful, I suppose. How'd you get through that uh, mentally, like, as a young kid, obviously, so excited to be about to have your NRL debut, then it's taken away, and then obviously the next year pretty much taken away from you too. Must have been tough mentally. Oh, definitely, bro. And, but this is when Ian Miles comes into the picture because ah, he's okay. a sports psychologist. Yeah. And, and, oh, he was. <laughs> is he? <laughs> and um, <laughs> that's where me and him had an awesome relationship from that point because I was going through all these setbacks. And I was thinking, like, why is this happening to me? Like, why, what have I done wrong? Um, and that's when, yeah, me and him used to you know, spend a lot of time. That's when I got into the Pinnacle program. What's the Pinnacle program? So it was a program where young aspiring uh, New Zealand athletes are trying to get to the Pinnacle of their sport. So um, oh, yeah. Adam Hall, he was a skier. Um, he had spider bifida, but he won gold and like two Paralympics. Um, Stormudu, Peter Taylor, they had all done it. Um, so they do done the program and then I applied for the program and then I got into the program and, um, Ian ran the program Did he? and that's how I, I built a really good relationship with him through 2009 when I was going through my ACL rehab. Um, and that's how our relationship kind of started. Yeah. And then how did it grow from there? Obviously you were speaking to him about your injuries and stuff and he was, well, I guess mentoring you through how to get back. Um, how does it sort of go to that next level where he becomes like, you know, your best mate? I suppose, you know, you, you've gone through big injuries yourself. Um, yeah, it can be some dark times kind of thing. You're watching all the boys having fun mm. and you're just on a what bike or you're just on a rowing machine just getting flogged every, every training session. Um, like he... I, he introduced me to Storm Udu. He introduced me to Peter Taylor. He introduced me to Olympic athletes. Mm. And that's when his credibility was like started um, going like he, believable, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we spent time with them. Um, and they all spoke really well of Ian. Um, and he did a lot of yeah sports psychology work with me through the through the pinnacle program. Um and yeah, we used to have a lot of heart to heart conversations about about life, about my upbringing, about yeah, a lot of deep topics that not many other, I suppose, sports likes would do. And mm -hmm. he always had time for me, bro. He, he'd always like I could talk, I could call him, I could text him. He'd always reply. And just over three years of doing that constantly, mm. just build my trust for him. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much how the relationship just got better and better between me and him. Like, uh, and there was no one else in my family I could turn to for this kind of information. Like, mm. bro, my old man, he's a dairy farmer, bro. Like, what do you, what do you know about sport kind of thing? Like, um, you know, no, no uncles or aunties that could give advice, um, uh, you know, financially, like no one, you know, there's no one in my family I could turn to kind of thing. But, yeah. and here was Ian, bro. Like he, like he, had, he, had, he was sponsored by Hyundai. Um, he mentored Olympic athletes, um, and they all spoke really well of him. 
And so I, I just thought it was a win-win for myself. I was like, yeah, man, I've got someone in my corner that can help me out like, on the field mentally. He could help me out financially. He could help, you know, give me some good advice. And yeah, but um, that's how the relationship got really good. Mm. And what sort of like financial advice was he giving you to sort of gain his trust to give you the, I guess, permission for him to have access to your accounts in the end? Uh, bro, we're setting up trust. Like, he showed me what mm. a trust was. I don't know what a trust was. Like, yeah. They introduced me to an accountant, bro. I didn't know what an accountant was. And like, all this kind mm. of stuff, because obviously my upbringing, like, there's not much of those conversations going around. Um, and, and, bro, just the, just the constant uh, being able to relay information to him. And he would introduce me to, I don't know, uh, the Hyundai CEO or the New Zealand Sport. Um, sports psychologist and I talked to him about um, their dealings and his wife is a real estate agent in, in Christchurch uh, so I, yeah, I spoke to her for a little while like about you know maybe investing in a house or what should I do kind of thing like so he gave me a lot of different options um, and again there's no one in my family I could turn to kind of thing so I thought I was 19 years old and I thought, bro, like this guy's going to help me out big time. And I, I was really grateful for it too because you know, I didn't have no one else to turn to kind of thing. Mm. Mate, it, it sounds all so legit, eh? Like, bro, that's the thing. To you talk about it. Like, do you think it was legit at the time? Like he was genuinely, he started off the process really genuine or do you think it was as planned from the start? Oh, bro, I think... It had to start genuine because there were so many times we spent so long talking. Mm. He invited me into his house. I met his son. I met his wife. Uh, we had lunch. We had breakfast together. Um, I met Razor. He took me to go surfing with Razor True. Robinson. Yeah. And like, you know, all these things are just building my trust. Like every time he's doing it, I'm just like, oh, bro, he's a man. Yeah. Like, you know, he used to fly me to Christchurch, Queenstown, just to meet Razor. Yeah. Um, because he thought, you know, Razor will be really good you know, if you learn off him, like da 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 da. Mm. And I was like, yeah, man, sweet. Um, just setting up all these meetings for me. And, you know, I was 19 years old. You know, just broke into first grade. And um, I, I think it was genuine at the start, definitely. Mm. Definitely was genuine. And um, and then, yeah, obviously, you know, you know what happens, but down the road. Mm. You just start thinking of things what he said back then, and you're just like, "Wow, no, surely not." Like hindsight, you know. Yeah, there's a few, towards the back end. There's a few things we just like, bro. What was I even thinking then? Yeah. But after like five years, six years of relationship, built of, the trust. Everything was kosher, bro. Everything was cool. Like, mm. I, yeah, I met a lot of some Crusaders players as well. Ash, Ash Parker. Oh, who else did I meet? Oh, one of the other boys. But they took me to a game. They took me to a Canterbury game back in the days. Like, Fair like yeah. And then and Ian was working with them as well. So I was yeah. like, oh, bro, he's got to be legit. Right. So then your decision to make him, because he becomes your manager in the end, doesn't he? He becomes your own personal manager. Yeah. What was that? Yeah. How did you get to that point where to make that decision for him to take over? Uh, so we made the decision together after we were having lunch at the, uh, dinner at the Stanford uh, Hotel in Auckland. Um, and I just thought it was a no-brainer for me. Like, honestly, I didn't mm. think twice about it. Especially after all we've been through. Um, I was, yeah, my dad died as well. And he, like, you know, helped me through that process as well. Where, like, he was there all the time. And that made me even trust him even more. Um, but, yeah, we both come to the decision. I thought it was a great decision. Like, I'll... I remember talking to my teammates. They were, they were complaining about their manager because they never hear from their manager. Mm. And I was saying, bro, I hear from my manager like every day, nearly like every every week. And they were complaining that they only hear from their manager when their contracts up. Mm. So I was like cheering um, the whole time because I thought I was in good hands. Everything seemed legit. Um, yeah, so we made that decision together, and then he went and got an accredited because at the NRL, if you want to be a manager, you got to be an accredited manager. So you got to go through a lot of process. So this stuff doesn't happen, bro, but it still happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, a, that's another, that's another, head, that's another one. Um, but yeah, that's how it came about. And then he got you a contract? Yeah, yeah, so that's when I signed with the Penrith Panthers. Oh, yeah. 
And for, uh, yeah, looking back, the Warriors offered me a, a deal. I thought it was great. And he was like, nah, nah, don't sign it. Here's a printer deal. Just wait another year. And in hindsight, if I signed that contract, he wouldn't get any of that money. Oh, yeah. So that's why he wanted me to wait another year to sign the Penrith contract. Sure. And that's when he got the money. So the, just things like that, you just start noticing, you look back and you're just like, bro, that was, yeah. that was the setup kind of thing. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, he got me the Penrith deal and that's when I went to uh, the Panthers. But at the time, like, I would have loved to stay at the Warriors because I was, that's where I grew up. That's who, who I debuted yeah. with. Um, I wasn't too keen to go, but I was just listening to Ian's advice. He was just like, "No, this is the best thing for you. This is um, where you want to go for your your career to get better." It's crazy. Then, yeah, all it was was better for his pocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's crazy. madness. And he's got full access to your accounts at this stage. Yeah, at that stage. So as soon as I signed the Penrith deal, a month later, the the World Cup 2013's on. Oh yeah. So I got to fly to England. In like November, I think October, and so I, I shoot to Penrith, open up all my Penrith bank accounts, um, and he's already organised which bank accounts, how's it going to be set up, and everything. Obviously, I trusted him. I was like, "Yeah, right, yeah, you set it up. I'll go to World Cup." Da 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 da. And he was like, "Yeah, cool. I'll take care of it." And then, like looking back, obviously it's stupid, but at the time, bro, I just thought, "Yeah, man, you you take care of that. I'll just focus on training and footy, mm. and you you do that. I'll, I'll be cool." Yeah. And he gave you like an uh, allowance, was it? Like, was it 4000 a month or something to live off for you and your family? Yeah, cool, yeah. He, he looked after the rest. <laughs> yeah, Spent man. Spent the rest. Um, <laughs> yeah, so obviously that was what we had agreed to. And I was cool with that, man, because I was just like, okay, you yeah. stopped that. I'll just focus on playing my best footy for Penrith um, and try to play for the Kiwis again. And um, just focus on footy. I don't have to worry about anything else. And he, yeah, obviously he was like, yeah, yeah, that's sweet, that's fine, that's all cool. Um, yeah, man, I, just, I never questioned it for three years. And and the boys were saying to me when they found out all this, all the boys were like, "What are you doing, guy? You didn't check your bank account for three years? Are you yeah. serious?" That's what they were talking. And I was just like, "Bro, like, I, I never had to kind of thing. Like, I just had to focus on footy." As long as I, you know, all my bills are paid, which they were, yeah. like groceries, petrol, supplements, whatever, mm. then I could just play my best footy, bro. And they were just, yeah, yeah I remember my teammates, bro, taking this Mickey, and I was just like, <laughs> I can't believe you didn't check your. But I'm not a punter, like, and I hardly went out with the boys, so I don't need to check my bank account because I don't gamble. I don't, I don't yeah, I, I'll put, I'll, I stay at home all the time, like. Yeah, bro, that. Mate, it is, it is so crazy, eh? But, like, I, I guess a lot of people, as soon as that, especially when they're making decent money, the first thing they like to check at payday is how much is sort of rolled into the account. But you were pretty strict, and you got your 4,000 trusted miles, as you would, um, to look after the rest or invest um, that money into good things for you because you obviously felt like he had your best interest at heart, eh? Oh, bro, definitely. Well, after all we've been through, for like eight years, been through ups and downs, my career, my ACL, my dad dying, um, and all the mentorship, you know, him flying me around New Zealand to like meet Razor, to meet mm. Canterbury players. Um, bro, I just, yeah, that's how I got my 100% trust. Mm. And uh, obviously, yeah, in hindsight, it's, it hurts a bit, but during the time, bro, I, I thought I was onto a winner, and like, I thought, mm. this fellow's the man. Like, he's looking after me, and uh, so it's all good. Was he your best man at your wedding too? So that shows you sort of how far it, the relationship went. Right. Yeah, the more I think about it, just the more things just go, <laughs> what was I thinking? What was I thinking? Um, but yeah, we. so my wife's, my wife's uncle's a pilot. Mm. His name is Uncle Sean. So he, he taught me a lot. Um and so, yeah, you got tickets to Aisataki. If you've ever been to Aisataki, like, if anyone's been to Aisataki, bro, it's a beautiful place. Like, it's crazy beautiful. Yeah, and, like, he got free tickets. We got free tickets to take uh, Ian and his wife, like, on a day tour and that. Just things like that. You just look back and just like, man. Kind of hurts a bit. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, it kind of hurts a bit, but uh, yeah, I suppose you learn learn from those mistakes, man. Yeah, all these awesome memories in your life you've got, but then you've also got this memory of me and Miles just <laughs> hanging around the background too, just ruining <laughs> all your memories. Rent free, bro. Living rent free. <laughs> Living rent free in my mind. Just like, bro, stop. True. And then did he get you to the Tigers? How did that one work? Well, yeah, that's kind of when the red flags just started going oh, off. Okay. Like, so I had a really good relationship with Ivan at the Warriors. Like, really good relationship. And before Ivan left to the Panthers, Panthers he said, if you're keen to come, like, oh, I'll bring you over. Mm. And so I was like, yeah, sweet. And so my relationship with Ivan pretty much got me the Penrith deal. Like, pretty much. Mm. And then Ivan got fired from Penrith 2015. 2015, Ivan got fired from Penrith. And then um, Anthony Griffin came into Penrith and just did a big clean out. And I was one of the players that uh, were getting uh, pushed on. And yeah, Ian didn't really have any other options for me. And I was 25 at the time. So I was in my prime kind of thing. Yeah. And he had, no, he had nothing on the table for me. Um, and then we got through halfway of the 2016 season. And the Tigers were keen uh, for a lock. They needed a lock uh, to play for them. Um, and the Tigers of the CEO was also used to be the Tigers of the Penrith Panthers. And I had a really good relationship with Justin Pascoe. Mm. And I think my relationship with Justin kind of made the deal easier to go to Penrith. It wasn't really Ian's you know, ability to like get a contract kind of thing. Yeah. So, so that's when I moved to the Tigers uh, for the rest of 2016. And then um, I, pl I played really good for the Tigers in my first year there. And then Ian still wasn't, be able, wasn't able to get another contract beyond that. And that's when I started thinking, uh, something's, something's not right here because surely like, I'm only 26. Yeah. Um, and he, he said I was close to going to the Crusaders, like Crusaders were putting together a deal, but I think he was just talking it up. <laughs> Cause that never happened. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, he, he used to always say razor, are your razors trying to organise something for you? And uh, that never come, yeah, that never comes to fruition. So I just think he was just saying that. Would you have made the switch? Probably not, bro. Yeah, probably not. Cause if I went to rugby, then I've got to start again, mm. and I probably wouldn't be on the same as much money as I was you know, playing rugby league. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, going back playing like Super Rugby in there. So, mm. um. Yeah, but he used to always bring it up, you know, oh, Razor's emailed me kind of thing. Yeah. Like, I don't even know if that was true, bro, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll ask him tomorrow, but, mate, that sounds, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds crazy. Nah. But you were at the Tigers for how many years were you at the Tigers in the end? You, were, you must have got that extension in the end. How did he get that? So at the end of 2016, that's when I found out everything about Ian. Oh, right okay. at the end. Oh, hell. Yeah, yeah, so, and that's when his contract was up. Um, How'd you find out? Oh, we got a mortgage. We got a mortgage bill. So all, all of my bank account bills, they went to Ian's address in Christchurch. So, you know, maybe that was a setup as well. Like, So all of my banking bills, everything went to his house in Christchurch. True. Uh, but we got one for a late mortgage repayment. One randomly one day. And then, yeah, I opened up. I was like, there's no way we could be behind. Like, no way. Yeah. And then... They were like, you're such and such behind. I was just like, nah. And then, yeah, jumped on the bank accounts. And then I was just like, yeah. And then we went to, we went straight to Westpac and Penrith, into the, um, into the shop kind of thing. And then that's when I found out, bro. It was crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll never forget that day. Um, and then once Ian was out of the picture, I negotiated the Tigers contract myself and got it over the line. So it was it was kind of it was kind of good in a way, but uh, that's how I got my next contract was just me talking to Justin and Ivan because Ivan went to the Tigers as well. So uh, that's how that worked out. Right, that's crazy. So when you saw all those transactions in your bank statement. What are you thinking? 
this can't be true, bro. I remember looking at the screen. Yeah. Like in, in one of those cubicles at Westpac, they turn the screen to you, you know? Yeah, yeah. I was just looking at the screen, I was like, nah. <laughs> and then he'd just scroll down and he'd just keep scrolling and like, he'd just keep going. And I was just like, bro. <laughs> and then he scrolled down right to the end and then it showed the total figure. And I was just like, what? And then he said, oh, that's only 2014. Oh, and then wow. he showed me 2015. Bro, and I was just like, what? Oh, bro, and he just scrolled, 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 and he was scrolling forever. Yeah. It felt like forever. And then and he was like, oh, here's 2016. And then he was showing me all those transactions. Oh, and, I, and he said, oh, let me show you the credit card. And I was just like, oh, bro, no way. And yeah, it was just, uh, yeah. that was actually my reaction just doing these ones. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, so uh, we got everything printed out, chucked it on the USB, um, sent it to the Rugby, uh, Rugby League Players Association in Australia. Bro, right, they're really good. Um, they helped me out, gave me some advice. Uh, sound advice was good, and um, that's where it went from there, man. All right. What was your wife's reaction? What was she thinking through the whole... For the, through the whole experience, I guess. Did she ever have Bro, um, a suspicion? I told you. <laughs> <laughs> Bro. See, oh, yeah. Bro, she was just saying, I told you. I told you. And I was just like, fuck. Oh. Because there was, there was a few times, like, um, one time, yeah, we, I, I went over my 4,000 and I was like, we just asked for asking him for more money. Yeah, sweet. And then Ian was like, "Oh no, we can't. We can't get use that money until your next pay comes in." And I, I when he said that, I was like, "Oh, it's all right." But then she was like, "No, nah, it can't be right." But I kind of kept her out of everything. I didn't really share what me and Ian yeah. were doing, kind of thing. But that day at the at the Westpac office, and she kind of, you know, a woman like bro, they know how to <laughs> sniff something out, bro. Like, <laughs> and like. That day, she was just like, I told you, yeah. babe, I told you. And I was just like, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, bro, uh, bad. But um, yeah, God bless her, man. Like, yeah, she's been through me, with me through those yeah. tough times, eh? Um, and she yeah, really helped me, supported me um, through, the, through that. Yeah, really grateful for her, man. Did you think you were going to get that money back? Or did you, Or did you, when you saw that, were you like, oh, this is gone? Or you're always hopeful that, you're going to be getting that back because obviously someone just can't steal four hundred thousand dollars out of your your bank account, can they? At the start, bro, I was obviously naive to the law. I mm. didn't know much about the law and how it works. What's a civil court case? What's a criminal court case? How does the laws work in New Zealand? How do the laws work in Australia? Mm. Like, obviously, I was thinking, bro, just go and arrest them, get my money back, done. Yeah, like you know. How simple is that? How hard is that? <laughs> <laughs> How hard is that? Honestly, got all the evidence. Um, but when, yeah, like, so I was pretty confident I was going to get it back because I thought it'd be an easy process. Like, mm. a few phone calls. Yeah, sorry, mate. Yeah, here you go. Drag it back. Yep, yeah, cool. Um, but yeah, that definitely wasn't to be. Um, the longer the process went on and the closer we got to court, before I engaged with Chapman Trip lawyers, um, they were just giving me a legal advice and they were just uh, legal advice and they were saying um, like the chances of him declaring bankruptcy is pretty high um, and they were looking over his record and they said he's done it before True. and so he's probably going to do it again Oh, wow. uh, and this is after one year of just talking with the RRPA the Players Association in Australia like just trying to should we go through the Australian courts? Should we go to the New Zealand courts? Because it was an Australian bank account, obviously. Mm. Um, and then we decided, yeah, New Zealand courts. And then we decided Chapman Trip. Garth, bro, he helped me out so much. Willie's helped me out so much. I'm really thankful for them uh, at Chapman Trip. But, yeah, the closer we got to the date, the more feeling it was just like, bro, I'm not going to get this money back kind of thing. And then a week before we finally get to court, which took, 
what four years just to get to court three years four years holy yeah from from the day i found out till yeah. we got to court right that was like three years that's a long time of just simmering on yeah on all of it just stewing on all of it bro and just like you know when you do this hard training that you're like doing a conditioning session and yeah. you start thinking negative thoughts and that. like that was the first thing that comes to my mind bro i was just a and pops in <laughs> bro what am i doing like why am i doing this why am i doing this wrestle session yeah. Um, but yeah, finally got to court, and then two weeks before the court case, it was like, oh, I'm bankrupt. I've got no money. I've got mental health issues. I can't make it to court, um, even though the court's like 200 meters from his house, uh. walking distance. Um, it's crazy. Like back in the sports like days, he used to always tell me um, corruption in sport. He used to always tell me like. <laughs> thing like tell me things about him what he was actually doing and I was just like was he taking the piss was he even taking the piss right like um yeah and then so the court case happened got the result on all charges you're yeah, proven proven yeah proven guilty uh ordered to pay back what 450 450k I think 500k mm. and he was just saying he's bankrupt got no money got mental health issues you can't touch me pretty much and um, that was it bro hey, that's it makes my blood boil eh, when I listen to right. it it's so frustrating how how someone right. can just do that and claim bankruptcy and then what get, get away with it and he lives in Christchurch right bro right in the center of City, like a nice ass house and his wife's mortgage free 100 percent, bro it just makes you wonder it just makes you wonder just like you know what the heck that's not fair like that can't be fair yeah how does that work and then my lawyers were like oh there's people that do that all the time and i was just like oh, wow like the place yeah. you know kind of makes you question a lot of things in society kind of thing like um, just how trusts work and what's a trust and how they're set up to protect people when this does happen. Mm. Um, so I learned a lot bro, about the legal system and about the law. Yeah. I was just trying to take some positives out of it, bro. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, bro, I gotta find the positive somewhere. somewhere. A $400,000 lawyer oh, education. Bro, like, oh man. Yeah. And then, um, so after that, um, they said, oh, you know, take it to the police. They might be able to help you out. So I mm. took the court case to the police, just gave them the file, of, you know, succeeding in the civil court to New Zealand police. I gave it to them. And then they were like, no, nah, we're not going to do anything. And I was just like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> bro, he just took like four hundred fifty thousand from me. You got evidence yeah. in your lap, and, you, and you're not gonna do anything. And they're like, "Nah, he's he's a little bit old. Like, you know, he's he's no threat to anybody else." And I was just like, "Bro, yeah." All right. And you said that he uh, claimed bankruptcy before. So he had he done this before the whole the whole process of that before or. I don't, I don't know. So my, my lawyers, I don't know how they found that information, mm. but they, they told me like when they, when they did it, I don't know, a check on him or something that, yeah, it came up that he declared bankrupt before. But this was way before he yeah. uh, when he used to race motorbikes. But, um, yeah, he never told me that in this sports psych stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a lot he left out. Um, yeah, man. So that's how that's how that unfolded. So, did you ever speak to him once you found out? What was your like communication? Like, obviously, you spoke every day, multiple times when you guys were good. But once you found out, once you sent him that file of what had actually gone on, what was your comms like? Well, that was it. I sent him a screenshot. I think a screenshot of of the bottom of the total. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and a question mark. 
and that's the last I've heard from him, kind of True. Like a person. What about in court or anything? No. Nah. No, he didn't even turn up. Didn't oh, turn up. Really? Didn't, no, nothing. Um, obviously, I read what he said to his lawyer through his lawyer. Yeah. But I read it on a piece of paper. Um, yeah, but contact wise, no. I, I saw. Sorry, I saw him in a mediation meeting early 2017 but we hardly spoke I just shook his hand and the lawyers were just talking um, this was in Christchurch but that was the last time I had any contact with him mm. yeah it's just so crazy bro like it is. Uh, you just never think that would happen you never think that especially like what you've been through and um, for that to happen to you is pretty crazy yeah, I don't want to happen to anybody else for sure. Mm. No way, no way. How can you stop it? What What would your advice be for obviously guys in similar situations? Um, how would you av- How would you avoid that in hindsight? Because obviously, he went through a fair amount of detail to get your trust, and mate, he put a lot into it. Yeah, um, honestly, bro, just simple notification on your phone connected to your bank. Yeah, like as soon as something happens in your bank, you get a notification on your phone. Yeah, but I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have. If that, if I had that, like, and I saw a, a trip to Fiji <laughs> pop up on my freaking <laughs> at the Hilton in Fiji, something pop up on my thing, on my freaking notifications. You just checked into yeah. the Hilton in Fiji. I was just like, what the? <laughs> like, just something simple like that. Like, if you're out there and yeah, just notifications connected mm-hmm. to your phone. Yeah, anything touches your bank account, you get a notification straight away. And that that would have saved me so much drama. That, that would have saved all of us, man. Like this, you know, if I saw a dodgy yeah. payment, I would have got a notification yeah. and then that was it. Did, how did he make sure that you weren't checking your bank account? Or did he just, was he just lucky that you're one guy that never checked his bank account? He was a sports psych, man. So he knew me inside out. So he knew what I was, <laughs> like, honestly, he knew. Like if I played a bad game and we'll talk after it, he knew exactly what I was going to say. Like he knew, like yeah. that's how well he knew me after like eight years. Um, and again, there was no reason to check my bank account. Like I wasn't making mm. massive um, purchases or anything. Um, mm. The boys will call me a tight ass bro because I never went out with them and had coffees and that. They'd be like, oh, you tight ass, yeah. like... <laughs> Your shout, because I'm not, bro. <laughs> Shouting miles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bro, lad, what a lad, that's bro, cracker. Um, yeah, but I, I never had to, bro. Like, right? and, and I'm not a punter too, so I'm not like mm-hmm. dipping mm-hmm. in, getting money to put on a bet. Right? So, yeah. What was he spending your money on? Did you ever? You obviously saw all that. Yeah. Oh, hotels bro like going to those expensive like pandora shops and all that shops in sydney like right in the city because i lived in penrith and it's kind of the sticks in penrith compared to like sydney city but after like leaving penrith you'd stay like two nights and right in darling harbour like flash hotel bro boy crazy gifts for his wife like i didn't even take my wife there to get those stuff (laughs) (laughs) bro and he's just, yeah, he's just racking up um, like flights to flights to Fiji, like flights to Melbourne, hotels in Melbourne. Because his son Jordy lives in Melbourne. Um, oh, yeah. He like runs the F one down there or something. Um, yeah, bro, and just seeing all those transactions, eh? And it's like wow, crazy, mm. crazy, yeah. yeah and obviously, like moving some money to the, their trust, obviously because. You know, that's, you can't touch it once it goes into someone's trust. Mm. So that's, um, that's another one. Oh, mate, it's so crazy. And then you um, you obviously finish your time with the Tigers and then you make your decision to head over to the UK. Why did you why'd you decide to head over there? So my contract was up at the Tigers. Um, Madge, who was the coach at the Tigers at the time, said like they're not going to re-sign me. So that was cool. He was up front about it. Um, I was hoping this was in the 2020 and I was deep in my um, my CPL, my, my pilot 
studying at the time. Um, so I was just focused on getting my license. Um, and I, I, I was pretty content with footy after that, especially after going through like all me and Miles and stuff like that. Uh, I had enough of footy, man. I was just like, bro, I need to do something different. Because this that was draining, man. Three years that just being on your mind all the time. Um, yeah, so I, that's when I ripped into my, my pilot study. And um, towards the end of the back end of 2020, my manager was looking for something else, Tyron Smith. He um, he helped me out a lot through this whole process as well. Shout out to Ty. Um so he was looking, but I was more focused on getting my license and then going to the airlines. Oh, yeah. That's what I was focused on doing, going to uh, fly for Qantas. Um, that's what I wanted to do straight after 2020. And that's what I planned. And then COVID hit. And then all the airline jobs, gone. <laughs> just like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, they were all gone. And I just got my license too. Got all my tickets ready to go to the airlines. And then no one was hiring. And then Ty said, look, mate, there's an opportunity to go to Salford. Are you interested in two years? And I was just like, yeah, bro, yeah, because there's no way I'm getting into the airlines now because mm. COVID shut down everything. And so that's when I made the decision to uh, come to Salford, come to the UK. It was a great challenge. It was a good opportunity. I always wanted to come play Super League one day. Mm. Heard a lot of good stories about it, uh, past players. Glad I did. Um, yeah, some awesome experiences so far. And uh, that's how I ended up in, in Salford because COVID pretty much made me come in. Crazy. So you were done. You, you In your mind, you were mentally done with footy and you're ready to be a pilot. Yeah, bro, because well, the way Michael Maguire trains, like he's got a <laughs> reputation, bro, of like hard-ass training, yeah. which is absolutely true absolutely true like <laughs> he's a man of his word man like the way we trained at tigers is bro i've never trained that hard physically before and i've done a lot of hard trainings but it was mainly the contact because it was really big on like full contact yeah. strap up mouth guard run it straight 100 percent. and we did that for like bro, sometimes an hour 40 oh sounds like a nightmare oh bro like when you're 30 years old bro you don't want to be <laughs> Honestly, just get the ball, run 10 metres as hard as you can into Benny Manolino and Russell Packer. Bro, just boom. Just getting smashed. And you just keep doing that for... Bro, mate. Anyway, bro, that training was so hard. And I was bro, I was sick of footy. I was just like, nah, bro, I'm not mm. doing this again. Mm. And then... Um, yeah, that's when I was just like, bro, I've gone through the EMR stuff. I'm off that. Did it the two seasons with Madge training was crazy hard I'm off that so I was just I was over footy ground I was gonna stop I was gonna finish and that that gave me more motive to study hard and like get through my theory exams because I knew that the end date was coming but that that is a hard exam by all accounts is is to get your pilot license so oh, bro, yeah. um, juggling that while playing footy um no no mean feat how did you manage to do that yeah, bro, those theory exams, there were a lot of times where I was thinking, bro, I'm like way, I'm way in too deep. Mm. Like, this is way too big. This is way too hard yeah. for me kind of thing. Um, but I knew I had nothing to fall back on. Like, if I had a big ACL, like, bro, I had nothing. I was a footy player all my teenage years until I was 30, and there was nothing. And I had kids, I had responsibilities, you know, I had, I had to provide, um, and that's what gave me the energy and motivation to just keep trying to crack this exam. Mm -hmm. uh, flight planning, ATPL flight planning, like any pilots out there, they'll know that's the hardest exam because you've only got a certain amount of time to do crazy calculations. And if you get one thing wrong in the calculations, the exam's gone. All right. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was really tough, a really tough time, but... I was just over it, man. I was over training. So in between training, so we're coming in the morning, we'll do 40, like conditioning and that, and then we'll have like an hour break. So I'll do some study during the hour break in my car, or I'll go in the massage room or a quiet room um, and do some study, and then we'll do weights. And then I'll have a feed and do some study at the same time on my phone 
of these exams on my phone were pretty sweet. And then we'll do wrestle after that. And then when I get home, I'll just study. Um, one of my off seasons, so in our off season, we have five weeks off, six weeks off, I think. Yeah. And then, bro, I sacrificed no holiday. I just stayed home and studied, bro. Like, because I knew, I knew I was under pressure because I got responsibilities and that. And mm. um, I was over football. I, bro, I kind of hated it, man. I hated it after a while. Especially with all the pressure in the NRL too, like playing that kind of game, um, being scrutinized every week, um, the depth that was coming through at the time. And um, yeah, bro, I was just over the pressure. Mate, that's unreal. That's unreal um, drive from you to be able to juggle all that, um, sacrifice your your off season um, to get to get it done and and you've got it now, and is that what you want to do post footy once you finish? Is that is that still the dream? Yeah. So um, as soon as I finish here, I'll, I'll probably shoot back to Australia oh, and yeah. then apply. I've, I've got to get current on my landing, so I've got to get current on my uh, like how to land an aircraft. Because if you haven't landed for a while, you lose your currency. So oh, you got yeah. to do a refresher. Yeah. You always got to do a refresher, but you got to pass that refresher. So I've got to get through all that again. Um, I don't have to do any exams. I've just mm. got to do a flight test and show that I'm I'm capable of doing it. Um, and then I can apply it for the airlines and that. Yeah, good. What's the, what's the dream airline? I don't know, man. Like, I was just, my mate that helped me out, his name's um, Ben Harris. He used, to, he used to play for the Bulldogs back in the days, 2004. Oh, yeah. um, he's a captain for Qantas. And he, so he helped me out a lot, like with studying that. And so he was trying to get me in the door there. So hopefully, if I go back, there's an opportunity to um, get into it. Right, how good would that be? Big Captain Taylor speaking over the <laughs> the announcer. <laughs> how good. Right, now I'm looking forward to it because I know my body's going to be wrecked. There's not much I'm going to be able to do, yeah. especially after playing rugby league for you know, 15 years. Like my knees, my shoulders, so... Yeah, it's a, it's a job that I could do without being in pain, kind of thing. Yeah, but there's another job you're you're pretty damn good at too. Um, boy, music, the rapper. Uh, how where does this sit? Does this is this like the ultimate dream? Would you love to take rapping full time? Uh, I don't know. I think like I'm pretty boxed in with um, the content that I can and talk about, um, and I think I've always liked hip hop when I was since I was young I used to always listen to heaps of rap mm. like all the time. Um I don't listen to it as much as it today but like yeah M Park, Biggie, Pun like heaps. Um that's you know when you grow up through your child childhood yeah. that's all I, I remember like just listening to that kind of music. Um so it was always a hobby like so whenever the Warriors would fly I'd be making music on my iPad we're in the hotels all the time at Warriors so mm. there's always heaps of time on your hands to try and do something make some music in that so I really enjoyed that aspect of it as well and the freedom and create creativity that you can do with it uh, but I don't see it like being get to, like too big like yeah I'm just, I'm just doing that as a hobby at the moment Mate, I think it's about to explode. I've been I've been jamming your music on the way to work the last few weeks. Oh, <laughs> mate, lyrically, one of the greats. No, like as long as I try and get a positive message out through through my mu- music, like I'll never mm. rap about. That's what I was talking about. I'll pretty box myself in, so I'm not going to be talking about like women, money, cars, like all the all the stuff that that most artists talk about now bro that's just mm, that's mm. not edifying it's not encouraging at all like so i don't even listen to the rap i used to listen to when i was a young kid because yeah. that was pretty negative as well um so yeah so that's probably why that it's not gonna get any bigger because i'm pretty boxed into what i can talk about and like i'll, I'll never swear in a song i'll never mm, never swear mm. in a song so that's you know half of it gone so <laughs> um <laughs> But no, it's a, it's a hobby I enjoy, um, and something that I like doing, and it takes my mind away from footy as well. Mm. Uh, 
it's pretty relaxing too because you can be creative. Mm. Um, there's no boundaries kind of thing. So, no, it's cool. I enjoy it. Would you be co- confident to jump up on stage and perform like your songs in front of, you know, sold out Mount Smart? <laughs> Probably not. Not at the moment. Not at the moment, bro. Not at the moment. No way. Nah, man. Um, I don't know. One day, maybe, but nah. Not at the moment. Way too shy for that. <laughs> I, I even struggle like recording myself in a video clip. Bro, I struggle doing that. It's like, bro, I'm looking like an idiot. As I put that mask on. <laughs> yeah. So, I can't. Yeah, I can't get over that. <laughs> oh, mate. Well, whatever you choose, no doubt you're gonna be successful with the drive that you've shown but as always mate i've gone to the instagram for some questions and yeah cool um got some good ones pop up obviously the first one's about your um rapping uh when's the album dropping a lot of the fans want to know when boy music's big albums dropping first time on the shelves bro i'll I'll never charge anything for my stuff (laughs) it's always going to be free on youtube i'll never i'll never charge it's going to be free on spotify like that's how music's consumed now. Like, yeah. if you're a young, there's no point selling it. Like, you just got to get it out there. And, mm. Cause anybody can bootleg any music. Like there's no point. Um, so yeah, I thought about that. I was just like, nah, bro, it's always put on YouTube. It's all free. Anyone can listen to it. It's more reach. So I'll probably just do singles drops. I'll, I'll probably never, cause I think the days of albums are gone. Like there's mm. hardly any time you'd sit there and, and go through a whole album. Yeah. Like, because everyone's got a shuffle playlist, yeah, yeah, yeah. playlist, yeah. Spotify, like, everything's on shuffle now. So I think singles are the ways to go, like, drop singles, drop singles, mm. drop singles. Are you working on one at the moment? When's the next single dropping? Well, no, I'm doing a freestyle. I'm doing a freestyle at the moment. I'm um, just doing the finishing touches on the editing and that. But I noticed the freestyles, they get more reaction, I think. I don't know why, but even though I'm talking about so many different subjects um but they get the most reactions so i'll just i'll just keep doing that oh how good and the next one's actually on that it's from your good mate ben matalino uh can you drop us a freestyle 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 all right oh yeah i'm somewhere um oh yeah sweet uh gotta get up a lot of uncertain, bottled up, you've probably been hurting, had enough and the body is hurting. But mentally, you gotta get up, it's hard when you're shirking, having thoughts, should you dog up from working? Now you got a problem with burdens, turning into these hurdles, hearing voices with negative verbals. Your honesty's becoming concerning, then the drama is nurtured, you observe it, you gotta go purge it. Saying, is it really worth it? Gone from a hobby to working, are you bothered trying to make your game perfect? Cause I'm sitting in the lobby and I really wanna stop it, I'm learning if I cop another shot in the sternum. And I promise it's burning. My brothers say I'm soft and reversing. God dropped the reserves. It's not enough trying to follow the person. I want to be like Jonathan Thurston, but I got to get up. <laughs> you got to oh. get up. Wow, that is one of the greatest freestyles I've ever heard. Mate, in the flesh. Oh, how good is that? How do you, how do you write these or how do you come up with these? Just... Bro, usually after a game or after a con session, I don't know, I've, you know, after a concession, it was hard, and but you feel real good. Yeah. Like when you're having a shower, and you're like feeling good. Like yeah, like th- those are the times where I get the most ideas, eh? Like. You've got a gift. You've got a gift. You need to use it. Uh, well, Chucky God. Yeah, go again, go again. Oh, uh, best day, well. <laughs> What doesn't kill you make you stronger, but you heard it before. Word to my daughter, I'm hurt, but I'm working for your seven four. I'll be there when you call. I was there when you're born, there when you crawled, and it's you I adore. Motivation when I'm quartered and my back's on the wall. Well, I've been flawed, I've been showing my flaws. Would you support if I gave up on it all? And said, stop it and return to withdraw. Take off my cup for my curtain call. But hold up, I gotta show up even though I'm getting no love. Owners wanna know you so much because they own you. I'm losing a bit of trust in my corner. 1.2s, 4 and 5s, and beat tests keep me sober. But these voices keep telling me it's over. They're well in their coats there. I have a spell when you're down, you're supposed to. But I'm handling the yelling from coaches while I'm keeping kosher. I'm not selling off my soul to this culture. I'm trying to feel good, but my thoughts say I'm stuck. It's torture, my sport is corrupt. 
but I'm bored all these subs. I'm caught up, score bored as a plug. Caught as bluff, but the force is the clutch. So you got to get up. Oh, oh wow, wait. <laughs> One more. <laughs> <laughs> One more. No, no, no. No, no that, that's going to be a single got to get up. But that's, oh. that's not dropping for a while. That's all about footy going through hard times. Yeah, bro. I could hear it, mate. Yeah. Some some meaning behind those lyrics. It's so good. Love that. Can't wait for that single. Got to get up, mate. Got to get up, bro. That's. I, I think that would that would be a good good song. Yeah. To run out to. Yeah. Oh, we're on. Okay, next one. Uh, what's the key to making so many tackles? Obviously, you made seventeen a game once. That's unbelievable. Um, more than I made in my whole career. <laughs> I'd love to play rugby union, bro. <laughs> bro, like sometimes I hear the commentators say, oh, he's had a tough day. He's made four tackles. I'm like, bro. Um, I think in my mind all the time when I'm playing, I just want to look after my teammates. So if they need help in the tackle and I'm there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in there and help them. And like that's my mindset in defense anyway. Just help, help. How can I help? Like, mm. yeah, it's yeah, it's not, yeah, be a halfback or be a center. The job's so much easier. <laughs> Don't be a four. You played a bit of center, eh? Yeah, when I was young, when I was young, but mm. bro, don't play in the forwards. Don't. <laughs> was when you when you're making that many tackles, when you get to attack, what are you just are you just gone? You're just starting to think about the next set on D or. Do you still have energy to add an attack when you when you're there? Because that's that's a lot of tackles, eh? Yeah, no, nah, not really, man. Like after you put on kick pressure, oh. and then you hope your fullback doesn't drop it, <laughs> and then you hope your winger doesn't drop it, and then you hope your other winger doesn't drop yeah. it. So by tackle three, you should be on side, and then you're looking at what are your forwards say? Bro, you take it. <laughs> <laughs> you're looking at one of the guys bro you take it and then like after tackle four it's usually a shift or it's an early mm. kick and then as soon as that kick goes in you're just thinking defence and then you just get in a, they call it the washing machine bro and you're just in there third man and tackle back to A third man and back bro the grind yeah it goes on and on and on yeah oh bro you don't want to be in there like honestly any young kids don't play in the courts <laughs> Playing rugby league, bro. Don't do that. Don't. Okay, next question. Who was the hardest NRL player that you played with or against? Oh, hardest. So hardest player would probably be probably be Thurston, bro. Like, oh yeah, bro. He would just kick you to death. Like, yeah. You could put on the best set. You could defend the best, but then he gets your forty. He gets a forty twenty, or like he puts a grubber kick in. They're building pressure. You're defending your line again. Mm. Like in, and then you'll get his conversions from the sideline, just like, bro, this fella. Um, yeah, he, he'd be like any half of the good kicking game. Mm. It just puts you under the pump, like him or Kronk. Like, they'll just, it's not a fit, it's not even a physical thing. They're just kicking you to death with their kicking. Yeah. And like, it's just taking your energy all the time. Crazy, eh? What about Toughest? Toughest will probably be Simon Mannering, bro. Like, oh, yeah. he's a tough lad, man. Um, like, he'd done it all in the game. He was our captain at Warriors. He had done it all. Yeah. And there was not one time I heard him complain about anything. Mm. Like, that says a lot, bro, because there's a lot of footy players that complain about stuff. Yeah, I'd imagine, especially at the Warriors, too, eh? I'd, I'd imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, like, any hard training, he'll do it. Any hard game, he would never want to come off. Mm. And he wouldn't complain about anything. Um, bro, that's a testament to his character. Now, to me, bro, that's that's huge. Um, you know, we've got some pretty rough coaches. We've got some pretty rough trainers at the Warriors sometimes. Mm. And you never went behind in the changing room saying, oh, bro, this is shit. Mm. Or, bro, this is shit. Or, he never did that once, mm. man. Um, something I really admire. After that would be Chris Lawrence. Like, bro, his face got smashed in that training. Like, bad, bro, bad. Um, and then he was playing, like, five months later. True. Bro, tough, man. Tough. Tough. Mate. Crazy. Mate, that's cool about Mannering. Obviously, he um, 
he has a lot of respect in that group. Eh? He's what the Plough of the Year award. He pretty much won it every year he was there. I think it's called the Mannering Award now. Eh? So, bro, why? And I just really sad. Like he didn't get his NRL like trophy as well bro he puts mm. so much on the line for that jersey he works so hard as a captain as well and for the kiwis um yeah one of the new zealand greats bro like i think he's he was pretty underrated in australia like but back in the warriors man he was the man like he was definitely someone i looked up to as soon as i got into first grade yeah but down to earth i think he was a country boy as well um came up from nelson good nelson college man yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, came up from Nelson. Like, yeah, humble as, like, never arrogant. Mm. Um, yeah, man, he's someone that I aspired up to, for sure. Mm. Love that. Okay, next one. Best coach you played under? Probably Ivan. Yeah, Ivan. Yeah. Because obviously he gave me my first grade shot. And mm. um, we got a pretty good relationship at Penrith. Um, and then at the Tigers. So, yeah, definitely Ivan. Someone asked, was it um, the worst decision ever by the Warriors letting go of Ivan? Yeah. Yeah, man. That year, his last year, he got we got the reserves into the final. We got the under-20s into the final. And we got first grade into the final, 2011. And then last year, Penrith, the reserves in the final, the under-20s in the final, under-16s in the final, first grade in the final. And they all won. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that'd be one of the biggest mistakes the Warriors have made, for sure. Mm, Got it, eh? Could have been, could have been our year. Could have been our decade. Yeah, it just knows how to create good pathways, kind of thing. Mm. Um, and that Penrith, bro, that's just a machine right now. Mm, and next juniors are coming through. Next juniors are coming through. Um, yeah, they're going to be a force for the next decade, definitely. Mm. Okay, a couple of angry Warriors fans have sent in some questions but why do the Warriors suck like this is a harsh question but what is it about the Warriors where they haven't been able to um, get a premiership personally I think it's the travel oh, yeah, because that's the only thing that's consistent mm. from the Warriors start so the Warriors have been consistently not not as good as they could be um, but I noticed the difference bro living in Penrith compared to living in Auckland like playing Parramatta is twenty minute drive down the road. Yeah. But an away game for the Warriors, bro, that's a whole day of their schedule dedicated to travel. That's a whole day de- dedicated that's their day off is the travel day. You would know all about that playing super. Yeah. Um and then the return day, that's another that's another one of your days off gone. Um where in Penrith, bro, that was two days off in a row. You can just chill at home and you felt so much better. You went fatigued, but it has to be the travel, bro. Like um, compared to all the other teams, they got to the travel the most. Um, and people think, yeah, it's only a three-hour flight, but you got to think, bro. You got to get there at least three hours earlier. Yeah, it's up. yeah. And then you—that means you got to wake up even an hour earlier than that. So you're waking up at like four in the morning, and then mm. yeah, your flight's only three hours long, but you got to wait in the Kuru Lounge. You got to check in. Buses and all that. Bro, buses, hotel, the all hotel, that, uh, yeah. And then you have your dinner, and that's the only thing that's been consistent. And the Warriors have been inconsistent because mm. they've had different coaches, they've had all the different things. But that's my opinion. Mm. Uh, the travel, if they can cut down the travel, I think they'll be all right. It's a valid point, and it would be cool. I know, I think Sean Johnson's pushing for all the Aussie teams to play there. Home games against the Warriors Bro, back sure. in Auckland this year. That would be cool. And then that, obviously that if that sense. happened, there'd be no excuse. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely no excuse. But that's the first time I heard that. But and yeah. Shawnee would know. Like yeah. Shawnee would know, definitely. Um, but yeah, they should. After all the Warriors sacrificed for them, for the competition. Yeah, mm. yeah it's only right they should. Yeah, that'd be cool. Okay, two more. Any tips for young players in choosing an agent or representing themselves? Uh, in my opinion, I think there's a monopoly of agents that run the NRL. So there's probably five big dogs mm. of agents that have all the biggest talent, like your Tedesco's or your, you know, all the big names are probably under five managers. So in my opinion, go with one of those five managers because they'll be able to 
get you in a deal because they've got a big dog at that club or you know like that's how they kind of work in hindsight you know one agent i know has half of his players at one one club oh yeah um and surely there's some deals that go on behind the back door you sign this bloke and then i'll be able to bring you in yeah you know, if you don't sign him well he's gonna leave so you yeah. sign him and then sign this kid as well like there's a lot of stories as you get older you hear these stories that go on in the back doors bro and you're just like oh, that's that's pretty that's pretty that's pretty bad but <laughs> if i was a young kid bro i'd be going to melbourne storm straight away i wouldn't question i'll be signing up for the storm whatever um and i'll be getting like one of the bigger big agents um in the game mm. and stay well away from ian miles but 100%. 100%. Okay, last question. Best piece of advice you have for a water lad listener? Oh, bro. <laughs> oh, man. Um, best advice? Uh, bro, life isn't fair. <laughs> a lot of people think life is fair. Well, life should be fair. Mm. That's not the real world, man. Like... As, as soon as you leave school, bro, you, you're a bro. Like the, the world's a, a rough place. Like there's a lot of play, people out there that will take advantage of you. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll backstab you. They're, they'll try and take your position. They'll try and get in good with the coach. Mm. They'll try and push you out of the club. Like, and that's only in the footy world. Like I'm not, I don't even know what the business world is like, but I, I assume it's the same. Um, yeah, life isn't fair. Because I used to always think, about Ian Miles and I was like, bro, I don't deserve this. Like, why do I deserve this? Um, and then with all the court stuff as well, I was just like, bro, like, can't I just get my money and leave? Like, I haven't done anything wrong. Um, but I, over a while, uh, I just come, yeah, just don't think life's going to be fair all the time because, bro, it's not. Uh, and sometimes when you go through school, you think everyone's, you know, good bloke, which, all good, but then you get to the real world and, bang you uh sometimes you get a rude awakening mm. but yeah that would be one very true and i guess no one got more of a rude awakening than yourself once you found out <laughs> miles Bro. had been still yeah 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 definitely crazy but mate how good what a what a podcast what a what a journey you've had um really appreciate you coming on um obviously i think so many kids will get um, heaps out of that, um, especially the young Hope ones so, yeah. um, who, are, who are probably looking for an agent or young, talented kids who are unsure what to do. Um, there's some, some really good lessons there. And, um, and and just on you, like what a career you've had and still going. Um, all the best with what's next for you, flying airplanes or rapping in front of um, 80,000 people, whatever it may be. I uh, wish you all the best and appreciate you coming on the podcast. Cheers, James. Thanks, bro. I uh, really enjoyed it, man. Thank you for that. It's cool. Mate. You're a lad. Appreciate it.